Yeah. yeah. Glory to God. Thank y'all. Y'all can be seated. They do a good job, don't they? Well, Brother Allen, stand up. Let's acknowledge Brother Pastor from Houston here. We've been to his church several times. Thank you, sir, for being here tonight. Yeah. Pastors, ministers in the house, would you raise your hand? Let me see you. Others, raise your hand. Okay, wonderful. Glory to God. Let me see. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Y'all stand up. Y'all stand up. Let me... We sure appreciate you being here. Wonderful. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Wonderful. Appreciate y'all being here. The Lord said to us when we first started our Friday night services, He said uh, uh, ministers would come, and, and He helped me understand that's in the widest sense of the word. You know, God has a lot of folk doing different ministries that not necessarily pastor or evangelist, but there, there's a ministry there, spiritual ministry. And he said they would be uh, uh, worn and tired, and he said they'd be renewed and refreshed. I believe that's happening in the house. I believe it's happening over the Internet. You know, I... I just came from a conference not long, a uh, few days ago, and, and um, got renewed, got, got encouraged. You know, ministers give out, but we need to receive. We need to be encouraged. And, you know, when you hear uh, uh, preaching and teaching, especially when you hear faith, it stirs you up. Man, oh, you know, I, I like to hear uh, a man or woman uh, teach, preach faith. And I'm not just talking about every sermon's on the subject of faith. I mean it's in faith. It's from faith. It's of faith. And uh, you can tell it. I said, you can tell it immediately. Like I've, I've said this uh, last weekend, I mean, yeah, last Friday, but uh, there was a missionary. This has been, oh, 25 plus years ago, and I'd never seen him before. And he was preaching that night, and Phyllis and I were there. And he'd gone about five minutes. I poked her. I said, I like him. She said, hey, you don't even know him. I said, he's got faith. I said, what do you mean? Five minutes? You can hear it. How many know faith is real? It affects the tone of your voice. It affects your countenance. It affects the way you walk. It affects the way you approach everything. It's real. And that just happens to be what we're talking about tonight. <laughs> is that okay with you? Somebody say faith, faith. In, in God. God. Faith in God. Faith in God. Go to Mark 11, please. Mark 11. And then also we'll go to Timothy, 2 Timothy. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, if you'd hold up your hand, our ushers have extra Bibles. We'd be glad to let you use one of ours. Hold up your hand and turn with us to Mark 11 and 2 Timothy 1. How big a hurry are you in tonight? Hmm? <laughs> Brother Kenneth Copeland, we were in their meeting, uh, was it last week before this past? And um, he was in another country a, a while back and uh, <clears throat> never been there before. And, and uh, he said he got up and spoke like he normally did. I mean, he went a good solid hour and a half. And, and uh, then he uh, prayed, and he went and sat down, and he said they all just sat there. <laughs> and said the leader of them came over to him and said, uh, Sir, is, is everything okay? <laughs> he said, Yes, everything's fine. He said, Can you go some more? <laughs> asking Brother Copeland can he go some more he said well yeah I think I can and they said oh please he said some of these folk you know rode the train for two days and nights to get here and uh, you know we ought to be thankful for the word of God that we have and you, you know it's, it's sad how unthankful and uh, ungrateful so many folk are and, and, and we don't 
you know, all, always have put the right value on the Word. Uh, you know, Jesus, he'd go long sometimes, wouldn't he? Paul sometimes preach all night long, wouldn't he? Don't get scared. <laughs> I'm not prepping you. It's not my intent. But you know, I, I, I'm well convinced in my spirit that th that is one reason why we don't have some things that we think we'd like to have. We're simply in too big of a hurry to get out. You know, uh, it, it, just as individuals or as ministers, you, you know if you've gone very far with the Lord, there's some things you just never find out about till you get past that first two or three hours praying. Did you hear me? If all you ever pray is 15 minutes, there's just a whole realm you're not going to find out about. And uh, in the Word, you know, you study for 30 minutes. If that's as far as you ever go, there's all kind of things you're, you're never going to touch. You're never going to get into. And service-wise, it's that way too. And, uh, you know, it, it, we don't want to go too long when it's dead and dull. But we do want to be led by the Spirit, and we want to be open. What if He would lead us to go further in a certain direction? Could, can we follow Him, or, or do we have to see the news? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Can we follow Him, or, or are we not able to wait on that sandwich? It's just the truth. I, I'm, I'm convinced that if we want the fullness of what He has for us, we have to be able to pursue him without constraints. We can't tell him, all right, now, Lord, we got to be out of here by such and such. We got to be done. I've got a roast in the oven. I got this and I got that. We, we got to be, well, the Holy Ghost is very accommodating, and he'll meet you as far as he can, but basically we're telling him we don't want everything. We don't want it all. This will be enough for right now. And we're, you know, human beings are very much creatures of habit. You, me, every one of us. You've you got to watch it, man. You, you did that this way the last 45 times. You know what you'll do almost without thinking? You'll do it the same way, right? If you, and we got to be aware and check with him because he could say something different, couldn't he? He could say, do it this way. He could say, keep going. He could say, don't stop. And if we'll be open, then we could get into some places we hadn't been before, some good, good places. Everybody say open. Stay open. Let's stay open. Stay open. Mark 11, did you find it? And 2 Timothy. Mark 11, Jesus had spoken to the fig tree and it obeyed his words. And Peter remarking about how it had changed so quickly, Jesus then took this as an opportunity to teach them, and thank God it's recorded for us as well, about faith. And we're familiar, at least some of us, with verse 23 and 24, how wonderful. But we're focusing mostly on verse 22 right now. Jesus said what? He answered and said unto them, Have faith. Faith in God. Have faith in God. I think it's needful that we specify faith. There's been enough time passed now and enough talk in a lot of circles about having faith and walking by faith and living by faith and being a faith person, and having faith for and releasing faith and how faith comes and how faith works that some people consider themselves to be almost experts on the subject of faith. But we need to be very specific. We're not just talking about faith. We're talking about faith in God. And it needs to be said. It needs to be qualified. Because you got a whole group of folks that are, you know, out to do exploits with their faith. And their emphasis is on their faith. And their faith is in their faith. And that's a problem. I said, that's a problem. 
He didn't, Jesus didn't say, have faith in yourself. See, there's a whole lot of uh, groups that even questions have been asked of, of so-called word and faith preachers and pastors and teachers and go, well, how are you, di what you're preaching, how is it different from so-and-so's uh, motivational speaking? They're saying be positive, speak positive words, have faith in yourself, believe you can do it. And I mean, they have big crowds and they have rallies and people get excited and Jesus is never mentioned. God's never brought up. How are you different from them? Oh, big time. Big time. We're not talking about, at least we're not here, talking about faith in ourselves. We're talking about faith in God. Oh, yeah. Faith in God. And that makes all the difference. Second Timothy, if you'd turn there, Second Timothy and the first chapter. Second Timothy. Chapter 1, verse 12. Paul said, By the Spirit, for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. Let's just stop right here. He was going through some, uh, some substantial persecution. And the enemy's objective with persecution is to shame, well, to fear, put, it, put in fear, and shame and discourage. They that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You can't believe for it not to happen. <laughs> now, you don't have to believe for the persecution. <laughs> It'll come without you believing for it. But understand how the enemy works. He's always trying to shame you. And you must not receive it. If you're doing what the Lord told you to do now, even if you're in sin, somebody say, well, if I'm in sin, I ought to be ashamed. And let me just give you this right here. Eliminate this phrase from your vocabulary. Shame on you. It's an ungodly phrase. It's an unbiblical phrase. It's a phrase of condemnation. And the Holy Spirit never inspired anybody to try to shame somebody. Shame on you. Don't say it again. Ever. To anybody. It's wrong. Are y'all with me? Yes, Break yourself of it. Treat it like cuss words. I'm serious. It's an extremely bad thing. It's the devil who puts condemnation on people. Are you listening? He's the one always trying to make people feel ashamed and guilty. Even, you know, someone says, well, sometimes in a service you'll hear people say, boy, the Holy Spirit really condemned me about some things in there. Oh, he got a hold of them. No. Really, he didn't. Go to, hold your place here. Go to 1 John. Show you what happened. 1 John 3. Man, we're off to a good start already. 1 John 3. And verse 20, well, verse 19, 1 John three nineteen. Hereby we know, don't you like that? Yes. We know. Last Friday we talked about living confidently. Ha, yes. <laughs> ha, yay. 
Hereby we know that we are of the truth. Not we think so, we're wondering about it, figuring it out. No, we know and shall assure our hearts before him. Now you could also translate that word persuade. Your heart needs to be persuaded, doesn't it? For if the Holy Ghost condemns us, are you reading? If who condemns us? Whose heart? Our heart. God's greater than our heart and knows all things. Didn't say he joined in condemning us, just said he knew it already. Beloved, verse 21, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God and whatever we ask we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Does God want us to have confidence or does he not want us to have confidence? Well, it's the enemy that's always trying to undermine our confidence and guilt will do it. One of the greatest confidence killers, the biggest confidence killer is condemnation. It absolutely will render your faith null and void. If your heart condemns you, then you don't have confidence toward God. Did you hear this now? We're reading scripture, right? It's got to be true. If your heart condemns you, do you have confidence toward God? No. So we got to get our heart where it's not condemning us. Or elsewise we can't have faith for anything. Can't have confidence for anything from God. Uh, so it didn't say the Holy Spirit was condemning us. What did it say? Without taking a lot of time, if you go back to John, the 16th chapter, you read actually the 14th, 15th, and 16th about the Holy Spirit's ministry. And the scripture says when he comes, he will convict or convince the world of sin. Right? Not condemn. Convict. And convict, like I said, is from the same word, convince. What will the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit will show you what is right and convince you, if you'll let him, of the truth and what is right. Now, oftentimes, when you see what's right, you see where you're wrong. Oh, come on, do you see it? In his light, you see where you've been wrong. And when you get light and you're shown where you're wrong, you'll do one of two things. You'll either humble yourself and repent, or you'll harden yourself and resist. If you're smart, you'll humble yourself because the humble get grace, don't they? And the proud get resisted themselves. If you'll humble yourself and repent and say, oh, Lord, See, your heart will smite you. Your heart will condemn you. That's not the Holy Spirit condemning you. That's your own heart. Oh, come on, can you see this? The Holy Spirit, I have found, and you'll find this to be true, even when my own heart is condemning me for where I've missed it, if I let him, the Holy Spirit's there to comfort me. Isn't he called the comforter? He is not the condemner. So this shame on you stuff, I tell you, it irks me when I hear people say it. You hear preachers say it. You hear people that think they're godly, that think they're, oh, shame on you. That's one of the most devilish things you could say. Ungodly. I mean, get it out of your vocabulary, friend. Please, get it out of your vocabulary. You don't want to be a voice for the devil now, do you? Well, he's the one that's saying shame on you, guilt on you, condemnation on you. Shame on you. The Holy Ghost would never tell a person that. Never. That's the devil. That's the accuser of the brethren. No matter how badly somebody's missed it, don't you know God wants them to repent? Why? So he can forgive them and forget it. 
Is that right? So that he can forget it. Now, he can cast their sins as far away from them as the east is from the west. Didn't he say, their sins and iniquities, I will remember no more than there's no way he's saying shame on you. Right? He said he didn't even remember it. And his objective is for you and I to know that he's forgiven us and to know that when he sees us, he doesn't even remember it. And he doesn't see it when he's looking at us. And if we'd believe that, the condemnation would go away and our heart would not condemn us anymore. And then we could have confidence toward God. Oh, are you excited about this tonight? This is the gospel. This is the good news. Whew. Fella could get excited in here tonight. Mm -mm -mm. He said in 2 Timothy 1.12, I'm not ashamed. He didn't receive the shame. And uh, if, you've, if, if you've missed it and your heart condemns you, repent immediately. Don't wait a day or a week or a month. Immediately. Why would you want to live in condemnation for a month and be faithless for a month? Repent immediately. Now, if you haven't missed it and people are trying to shame you for something that's right, then you just simply do not receive their shame. Aren't you ashamed? Aren't you ashamed of spending all that money on that church? Uh, no. Aren't you ashamed of flying around in that airplane? Uh, no. No. <laughs> Aren't you ashamed of wearing those nice clothes? No? Aren't you ashamed living in that nice house and driving new cars? Uh, no. If I thought it was wrong, I'd quit. I'd do something different. <laughs> I'm not ashamed. If I was ashamed of it, I should quit. I should do something different because I'm doing something wrong. Why am I saying that? People will try to put shame on you for stuff that they don't see and they don't believe in. And it's, I won't even go into it, it's hypocrisy to the nth on their part. But the main thing is that you don't let it come on you. Don't let, I mean, so I said, well, how can I keep them from despising me and, 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 and shaming me? You can't control what they think, but you could, it's totally up to you whether you let what they think become what you think. Right? <laughs> you just smile and say, well, I'm sorry, I don't believe that. Hmm? That's not what I believe. Now, Paul said by the Spirit, I'm not ashamed. What did he go on to say? Why? For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Notice he didn't just say, I know what I believe. What did he say? I know whom. I know him. We do have faith in the Word. But the Word is a person. Right? We have great respect for this book, the Bible. But my faith is not in ink and paper. My faith is in the one who said the words that's in the book. Come on, it's a big difference. My faith is not just in principles. My faith is in the person. And I know you may think that's oversimplistic, but friend, a lot of people are getting off. And they've gotten off. They're, they're into 12 steps and 9 steps and pull this lever and push that button. And, and do they? Their faith is in principles, which boils down to works. Works. I confessed 1,032 times and, and I cleaned up my life and I did this and basically I made it happen. Even if they don't say it, that's, that's kind of what you wind up with. But the truth is, <laughs> it's by grace through faith. Hmm? Let's keep it straight. 
And so if we made it through and we received, we ought to be saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He's the one. Now, we looked up the word. Go to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Man, this is so big. But you're believing with me, are you? Believe with me now for utterance. This starts in the middle of chapter 10 and flows into the great, we call it the faith chapter, chapter 11, but it, it really, uh, the latter part of 10 and even the first part of 12, chapter 12, go together with this at all. This wasn't written in chapter and verse originally, you understand. But in verse 22 of chapter 10, Verse 21, I should read, said, Having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Full assurance. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That sounds like what we were reading over in 1 John, doesn't it? If you don't have an evil conscience, evil means bad, a bad conscience, your conscience is not bothering you, your heart's not condemning you. Why? Because you've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Not because you never made any mistakes, but because you've been, been forgiven. And he said, their sins and iniquities I'll remember no more. Glory. That was right, just right there in verse 17, just a couple of verses before. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Now skip down to verse 35. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Patience for what? Patience with your confidence. It's not enough just to have confidence. You've got to maintain the confidence day after day and week after week. Confidence is another word for faith. You've, you've seen it numerous times already. Look it up in the Greek. You'll see sometimes translated, same word. But confidence, he said, requires patience. He said, for yet a little while, and he that will come shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Not just get out of trouble by faith, but every day. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Why would you draw back? Fear and no confidence. Keep reading. But we are not of them who draw back. Is that you? I'm not of them. If you're not drawing back, what are you doing? I'm stepping out. I'm moving forward. <laughs> not cowering in the shadows, but stepping out into the light and receiving. Not hiding, but coming boldly to the throne of grace to get help and mercy. We're not of them that draw back unto perdition or destruction, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now faith is what we're going to live by. He said, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Young's literal translation says, faith is of things hoped for, a confidence. Of matters not seen, a conviction. And this is the most accurate that I've been able to find. Study it out for yourself. These two words are the proper definition of faith. What is faith? Confidence. And what else? Conviction. Confidence of what is hoped for or what is expected. Why would you be expecting something that you got no reason in the world to expect to happen? Because you got confidence <laughs> in something he told you. Why would you be sure that heaven is real and you've never been there? Sure about the, that angels are real. Sure that healing power is real. Sure that the gifts of the Spirit are real. 
Faith is the conviction of what is not seen. Even though we don't see it, we are convinced. It's real. How many are convinced? You're not trying to be convinced. You're convinced. Heaven is real. God's sitting on the throne right now. Right? Jesus is at his right hand of majesty on high. And he's gone to prepare a place for me and you. He's a working on our place. Mm, 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 mm. You know, there are a number of people that have testimonies about going to heaven and coming back. Paul talked about it himself in the scripture. And some of them you wonder about, and some of them sound right to me. But you don't want to put too much stock in a story like that because it's not what the scripture said. It's their experience. But one fellow, I remember talking about this, he said he, uh, he, got, he got caught up and he saw his place. You know, when Brother Jesse was here, he said he saw. He, 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 he said he, saw, he knew where Brother Hagen lived. He said he didn't see his house, but he knew where he lived. He said it was, it was where the prophets lived. And he said, every place was a block mansion. A mansion that covered a block. Hey! And this, you know, somebody says, that sounds strange. Well, it's because some way or another, we got this idea of little white houses with columns in the front right beside each other down the street. Where'd, where'd you get that? He didn't say, in my father's house are many condos. <laughs> Did he? Many duplexes. Come on, help me out. What did he say? Many single family dwellings. Now, mansions. And if you look up the word, uh, it, it, one of the words attached to that is the word manor, M-A-N-O-R, which means, English word, which means landed estate. And the reason I bring it up, because that's what this guy said. He said, the Lord showed him his place. And he said, man, he said, I had real estate. He said, I had a lake in the back. It backed up to a mountain. And everything he looked at, he went, oh, oh, ah, oh, that's just what I, oh, I always. And that's just, and he said, the Lord smiled and said, I know what each of my children like. And I custom build each of their abodes. Do you believe it? Do you? It has to be that way. Custom build. We're talking about Jesus. Custom building. Does he know what you like? He knows things that you never realized you liked. Mm -mm 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 -mm. How are we going to get there? By faith. <laughs> So we better get back to this right here, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, our confidence, and the evidence of things or the conviction of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which were seen were not made of things which do appear. Now he goes on throughout verse after verse he, he gave us a definition of faith, but here he's given us now examples of faith. And uh, faith is so big and so many, multi-sided, many-splendored that just because you, you quote verse 1, that doesn't mean you know all there is to know about faith. And we're seeing it manifested and, and walked and lived in all these different people. And it's the same. How many of we got the same faith they had and have? These people are alive and well in that place we were talking about. We'll soon meet them. Do you realize you'll soon have the opportunity to meet everybody whose name is in this? Abel. Oh, man. It's Abel. <laughs> Noah. Ah, oh, can I talk to you, man? Noah. Of course, you'll have plenty of time. <laughs> I reckon nobody will say, I don't have time. No. <laughs> Won't that be refreshing? 
<laughs> These people are all alive and well. And uh, they each are in this book because they walked by faith. And they did it, they lived by faith, but there are specific outstanding uh, instances that this chapter records. Now one thing you'll see is that it's not always said in every word, every verse, but they had to overcome fear to do what they did. They had to overcome timidity. Remember the scripture that led up to this? We're not of them that draw back. Could Noah have done something different than what he did? Would there have been temptation not to build the ark and endure all the persecution and go through everything that he did? He's the perfect example of not receiving the shame. Isn't he? They railed at him. They called him old fool. You know, they said all kind of stuff for years. But he didn't receive it. Did he? He just kept on a building. Didn't he? Tell me why he did it. He had faith. Right? How did he do it? By faith. Did he have confidence that what God told him was going to happen was going to happen? He believed that. And so he prepared. Uh, the Bible talks about Abraham. Could Abraham have been afraid about going out where he didn't know he was going? Could fear have gripped him and said, man, you're going to leave everything you've established here and you don't even know where you're going. What if you get out there and get lost? What if you get out there and somebody robs you? What if you get out there and this? What if you get out there? You understand, the devil's the same uh, then as he is now and bringing thoughts of fear. Did he have to overcome fear? Did at some point he have to lay it aside and said, no, no, the Lord told me. So no what ifs. No what abouts. Sarah. Skip on down. Abraham, when he offered up Isaac, could fear have gotten, tried to get in with him? Oh, concerning his, his son being sacrificed? Did he have to overcome fear? Could fear have prevented him? Fear of losing his boy, could it have prevented him from obeying God? Oh, you know he had to deal with it, didn't he? And Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. Now skip down to verse 23, and it specifically says it in these verses. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months. Somebody say three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. Now that's a little bit vague to us in the King James, but we'll read other scriptures that talk about it. And they were what? They were what? Not afraid of the king's commandment. How were they not afraid? What helped them to not be afraid? Faith. Faith enabled them to overcome their fear of the king's commandment. Now, hold your place and go back to Exodus 1. Can you take this? Can you take a few more minutes? Hang in here now. Exodus 1. The Pharaoh had, uh, in verse 15 and 16, he told the uh, Egyptian midwives, or excuse me, the Hebrew midwives, excuse me, Hebrew, that when they saw a, a male baby, they were to kill it. And these women feared God 
and reverenced him and wouldn't do it. And the Bible said God gave them houses. That means he gave them husbands and families and children of their own. How many of whatever you sow is what you're going to reap? They sowed these, these families' children to them, and God gave them families of their own. And uh, verse 22, when this didn't work, the Pharaoh did this. He charged all his people. This was a nationwide charge or law. His word was law. Every son that's born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. And the Hebrews did it, I guess, by the thousands. They threw their newborn sons into the river. Now, what would make a daddy and a mama throw their infant newborn son into the river. Hmm? Only one thing. Right? They, they must have known if you didn't do it, you could lose your other children. What would motivate a mother and a father to do such a thing? It had to be fear of losing your whole family, losing your lives, well, you know, what do you think Pharaoh did? Obviously, some people tried to keep their babies. And when they were found out, there must have been some terrible things happened to the family because volitionally then, people would themselves throw their babies in the river. You'd only do that to save the lives of your other children. Had to be something along this line. But fear is throughout the Hebrew people in that nation. It's tangible. They live in constant fear. But when Moses was born, <laughs> his mom and dad looked in his little face. And uh, what did it say? He was a proper child. If you look at other words, he was a beautiful child. And they knew something was special about him. And they had enough faith in God, it overcame their fear. Oh, are y'all listening now? Enough faith will overcome any fear. They know people who've been slaughtered because they kept their baby. They know whole families that have been wiped out. They know what can happen to them. But there was something in them bigger than that fear. Somebody tell me what it was. It was a confidence. Oh, come on now. A confidence in their God that they'd be okay some way. Right? There was a conviction that he loved them and he would care for them and that he had a special call for this baby? Are you with me now? And it got in him. You know the story? They kept him long as they could. You know, after three months, they made a little ark for him, and they put him in it. See, that was the law. You had to put him in the river, but they gave him a boat. <laughs> baby boat. Now, come on, think about it. It must have been the fear of death was hanging over everybody. Or you'd never do that. There are crocodiles in that river. But how many believe they built the baby boat by faith? They put him in there by faith. Remember that? They're believing for something. that They've gone as far as they can with this. And, and they just knew in their heart, we can't keep him any longer. If we do, we'll all die. They just knew it. But they still were believing for something to happen. Hence, the baby boat. <laughs> and they sent him on a sail. 
And you know the story, Pharaoh's daughter came and found him. He must have been a pretty child. She looked at him and thought, ah, what a pretty baby. It was God. But that was in him. Go back to Hebrews 11. That same faith that was stronger than fear was in him as a young man. Hebrews 11, are you there? Verse 23, by faith, they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Somebody say, not afraid. Not afraid. Say it again, not afraid. not afraid. What will make you not afraid? In the face of terrifying stuff. What, what would, what's stronger than fear? Faith in God is stronger than any fear, including the fear, obviously, of death. Faith in God is stronger than the fear of any disease, including cancer, AIDS. Are you listening? Faith in God is greater and stronger than fear of any man, any attack, any crime, When our faith is strong enough, it delivers us from our fears. And we're able to boldly, confidently step up and do what he told us to do and step out and obey. Somebody say, I believe. I believe. Say, I'm not, I'm not afraid. And went on to say, by faith, Moses... When he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure in Egypt, for he had respect to the recompense of the reward. You could say it like this. What did he do by faith? By faith he chose. Faith helps you to make the big choices. When your faith is strong enough, even though it looks like your choice is costing you, you know in the end it's not going to cost. It's going to pay. Right? He was able to walk away from all that wealth, all that prestige, the rulership, the, the positions of authority, the easy life, life in the palace, being waited on hand and foot the rest of his life. I mean, a lot of people would not have walked away from that. They would not have left that. No, they wouldn't have. Remember the rich young ruler? The Lord said, liquidate. Give to the poor. Follow me. He wasn't asking him to take a vow of poverty. He was asking him to make a choice. Hmm? Choose me instead of your money. Choose me instead of your financial security that you got in hand. Choose me. He wouldn't do it. Why didn't he do it? Fear or not enough faith. By faith, verse 27, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, I many understand Pharaoh must have been a bad dude. <laughs> He's a killer. Mass murderer. No telling how many infants they destroyed and killed. But his faith in God delivered him from this fear. Somebody say it out loud. I have faith, I have faith. in God. Stand up on your feet just a moment. I'm not through, but you act, some folks act like you are. <laughs> can you take a little more, you think? Or I can pause here and say, come back next week. Hmm? I'm not done, though. Hmm? Somebody say, I have faith in God. And that faith, that faith is stronger than fear. It's stronger than any fear. 
that can come against me in this life. Lift up your hands and praise Him for it. Lord, your faith in me is stronger than every fear, any fear, stronger than every fear. Glory to God. Stronger. Hallelujah. Just stay standing for just a minute. Do you know what kept the first generation of Israelites out of the promised land? Huh? Was it the giants? No, because the next generation took it. Was it the walled cities? No, because the next generation under Joshua and Caleb took them. I mean, it was the same cities. It was the same walls. It was the same giants. So obviously, they could have taken it too. What kept them out? It was fear. Fear and unbelief. What did they lack? Faith. What did Joshua and Caleb of the next generation, how did they take it? By faith. They took it by faith. What's standing between you and the call of God on your life? The plan of God. The fullness of the blessings. What's standing between you and getting loosed and getting free from everything that's holding you back? It's fear. Fear. What's stronger than fear? Faith. 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 Said out loud, I refuse, I refuse to be held back by fear. I refuse to give in to fear and to be paralyzed and to be in bondage to be held back, to be be tormented. tormented. I refuse refuse to fear. fear. I have faith faith in God. God. That's how you can overcome fear. Be seated again for a few moments. What is the cure for fear? Faith, or we might say trust. You go to uh, Psalm 125, and I'm going to read a few, while you're turning there, I'm going to read a few verses to you for time's sake. Put up on the screen, guys, Psalm 56, 3. Psalm 56, 3. You're going to Psalm 125, unless you're just really quick. What did the scripture, scripture say? What time I am afraid, what do you do when you get afraid? I will trust in you. See, the devil will tell you, you can't help it. It comes, it grips you. The feelings, the heart palpitates, the sweat, the, the blood pressure. You're, you're tempted to worry you're tempted to fear. There's some fearful things. It's, it's happened to other people, and it could happen to you. And, and it's, it's there bearing down. What can set you free from that tormenting situation? Trust. Trust in Him. 56 and 11. Psalm 56, 11 says, In God have I put my trust. So What? I will not be afraid what a man can do to me. Oh, hallelujah. Isaiah 12, verse 2. Isaiah 12, verse 2. It says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. Come on, are you seeing a pattern here? How can you get out of fear? Start trusting. Trusting, I will trust and not be afraid for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and he is my song and he's become my salvation. Hey, fear, fear's come to all of us. I mean, all you got to do is live on the planet and fears come, thoughts come, feelings come, fears come. And one thing that didn't bother you, might bother somebody else more, but one thing that didn't bother them might bother you more. But the enemy keeps pressing buttons till he finds yours. 
If not, if anything else, just trial and error. And when he does, and you go, ooh, yeah. <laughs> that bothers me. You don't want to think about it. You don't want to talk about it. Tell me how you get out of this. How do you get out of this? Huh? Trust in God. What's going to happen tomorrow? I know this. God will be there. <laughs> what about when all that begins to happen? What's going to happen then? He will be with me because he never leaves me. He never forsakes me. Come on. He will help me. He told me he would. He said if I'd put my trust in him, he would deliver me. Didn't he say it? And friend, if you trust in those words and if you trust in the one who said those words, those feelings begin to come off of you. They begin to just melt off of you and the panic begins to subside and the peace begins to come in. And you say, it's going to be okay. I'm coming through this. I'm, why? Because I trust God. I trust God. I don't have all the answers, but I know he loves me and I know he's faithful. And I know nothing's impossible to him. Nothing's too hard for him. I trust him. I trust him. And when you trust him enough, the fears leave. Hallelujah. Whew. Psalm 71.1. 71, 71.1. 1. He said, in you, Lord, do I put my trust let me never be put to confusion. See, friend, when we're feeling panicky, when we're feeling confused, what's going on? Yeah, it's fear, but why? We're not trusting him. He told us what he would do, but it wasn't enough for us. Come on, get the picture now. If... You're in a situation that I know how to fix or I'm able to fix. And you're panicking. I mean, you're losing it. Let's say Brother Jim was. He, he probably wouldn't, but let's say he was. And I said, oh, Brother Jim, no, don't worry about that. I can take care of that. I've got what, what we need to, to fix that, and I'll do it. J j just j relax. It's going to be okay. And what if he wouldn't relax? What if he won't relax? He, still, he just hyperventilates all the more. And, and I really do have the ability to do it. And my word is good. If I told him I would do it, I will do it. But he, he doesn't calm down. What's, what's the problem? My, my words don't mean anything to him. He has chosen not to believe what I said. chosen not to trust. But what if he does trust me? And I tell him, oh, Brother Jim, I got it. I got it, man. I've done this before. I've been here before. I got the means. I got the ability. You just relax. I'll take care of this. And he said, oh, Brother Keith, thank you. And he just begins to relax and his blood pressure goes down and his heart rate slows down. What does that mean? What does that mean? Come on. He hasn't seen it happen yet. Isn't that trust? Well, how about the one who cannot lie and who has never failed and never let anybody down? When he tells you something, should you immediately relax? Should you immediately cast the burden of it over on him and the care and kick back and go, well, okay. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Glory to God. The Lord said He was going to supply all my needs. The Lord said. He said. That's why the scripture says, We which do believe have entered into rest. And if you don't get into the rest, it's because you don't believe. 
And people sometimes they try to make excuses and go, well, I, I, it's just too much. It's just too much. I can't, I can't handle it. It's too, it's too hard. No, it's not true. It's just not true. You just refuse to believe. You're choosing not to trust. You're choosing to panic instead of trust. It's your choice. And nobody can make you make the right choice or make me make the right choice. How many believe every day of our lives we could obey Jesus when he said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Did he say that? Did he, did he intend for us to do what he told us to do? Then can we choose every day and every night, no matter if it looks like death is looking us right in the eye, can we choose to say, I'll not be moved? He told me he would keep me. <laughs> and I trust him. See, this is not just trust in ink and paper. This is not just trust in a principle. This is trust in a person that he loves me, that he's faithful, and he will keep me. Somebody say, I trust him. Say it again. Say it again, I trust him. And see, when you're like that, you will enter into rest, the confusion will leave. The feelings of fear will leave. Oh, glory to God. Psalm 125. Here's another way of saying this. Psalm 125, verse 1. They that what? They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, <laughs> but abideth forever. And you'll see this for, we're going to show you other places where it says a similar thing. But basically, it is the idea of being immovable. When you trust God, you're not moved. When you're moved, it's because you're not trusting Him. Now, all of us that are at different places in our faith in God, but basically the question is, what does it take to move you? Because when you got moved, that shows where your faith ended. Strong faith is not moved, though all kind of things happen. Strong faith will stand in the middle of a hurricane and say, I don't care. I know what I'm seeing. I know what I'm feeling. I don't care if your knees are bumping together and the hair standing up on, your, uh, on the back of your neck, goosebumps all over you can say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, in the valley of the shadow of death, you're going to see some stuff. You're going to hear some stuff. And all of it's designed to scare you out of your mind. Right? But is it still your choice? Oh, come on. Can you resist symptoms of fear just like you can resist symptoms of sickness or symptoms of lack? are symptoms of anything else that you know you don't have to have. Oh yeah, see this is where a lot of people lose the battle is they feel the fear and the feelings are so real and what you see and the devil says, it's too late, you've lost it, look at you, you're just a basket case. It's not too late. Those are just symptoms of fear. They're just feelings, they're just thoughts. You can choose to resist them. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Those that trust, come on, read it again. Those that trust in the Lord shall be like what? Mount Zion. How many know there's one thing Mount Zion's not doing? <laughs> it's not moving around. At least not so as you could tell. 
It is fixed. It is planted. You show me somebody really trusting God, I'll show you somebody that's not moved by reports. They're not moved by feelings. They're not moved by bills. They're not moved by people's talking and thoughts and accusations. They are unmoved. Why? Because they're trusting in him. Oh, come on. Their, their confidence is in him. They're convinced of something that he said. They're fully confident and fully persuaded. And so this just doesn't move them. It just doesn't move them. Go to Psalm 112. Isn't this the situation of faith overcoming fear? Expelling it out of you? Leaving you in this confident place? Psalm 112. Boy, this is a wonderful psalm. You should write your name in it. <laughs> Psalm 112. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord. That's where you should write your name, right there. Blessed is Keith. Your name, whatever it is. Keith delights in the commandments. And just put your name throughout this. Verse uh, 2, his seed will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. And his righteousness endures forever. Now look at verse, well, let me just keep reading. To the upright there arises light in the darkness. He's gracious. He's full of compassion and righteous. A good man shows favor and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved. Forever. Now that's a long time. <laughs> the righteousness shall be in everlasting remembrance. Keep reading. Keep reading. Verse 7. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed. Trusting in the Lord. Oh, come on. Can you see this? What about a heart that's not trusting in the Lord? It's not fixed. It's not anchored. So what is it doing? It's moving. Where is it? It's all over the place. I mean, in the morning it's here. In the afternoon it's over here. Saying this today. Saying something totally different the next day. What's the cure for this? Come on, help me out. Now let's don't point fingers or think about somebody. All of us have been here at some point. Every one of us have wavered. Right? Yielded to wrong thoughts, yielded to fears. Every one of us have it some time or other, but it's not what we're supposed to be doing. And, and it, it's, it's us enduring torment for no reason at all. We could have chosen to trust. And oh, friend, when you absolutely make up your mind to trust your God, anchors all around fix you. Oh, come on. And your heart gets to a place where nothing can move you. People can say anything they want to say and you just smile all the way through it. They can give you reports that make other people want to run out and kill themselves and you just say, so? <laughs> Doesn't change this report. Don't change that. Oh, come on. Yes. They that trust in the Lord will be like Mount Zion that cannot be moved. Oh, somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid till he see his desire upon his enemies. How many know that must be a victory? You must have won because your desire was not for your enemy to win. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, friend, does this paint a picture? Does it stir you up at all? Does this excite you? Thoughts come to all of us. Feelings to come to all of us. Situations happen in life. Being a faith man or woman does not assure that you'll never have any challenges. Does not assure that you'll never have any tests or things to deal with. Oh, but you know what being a faith person does assure? He always <laughs> causes us to triumph. Thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you hold on to that in your soul? No matter what's going on, any person, any man, any woman of faith you want to see, you know, centuries ago or present day, you're going to see this same identifying mark. They're not moved. I said they're not moved. And we got a lot of people being moved. They go to faith churches. They go to word churches. They've heard about healing. They've heard about prosperity. They've heard about this. And it's all great. And they like to believe it as long as everything's going good. Hmm? But here comes a report. They just laid off thousand over there at the factory, and you're one of them. You'll see people that's been going to church for 15 years. Lose it. Just lose it. Not even come to church for, for two months and just pout and be depressed. That's not okay. I said, that's not okay. What's it time to do, saints? Trust God. And if you're trusting God, will you act like that? Will you crawl in the bed and pull the cover over your head? Huh? Will you cry that you can't cry anymore? Will you heave and, and go into a panic attack and have to get a paper bag and put it over your head? What, what will you do? What will you do? Go to the book of Acts. I think I'm, I can close with this. Oh, his heart is established. He even, he, specifically, he said, evil tidings. He will not be afraid. What's evil tidings? Bad news. Is, is it true that you could not be afraid no matter what kind of news they brought you? Four people think so. <laughs> well, Brother Keith, well, exactly what kind of news are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't matter. I said it doesn't matter. Glory to God. He shall not be moved. Though messengers bring bad news and evil tidings. You remember, we, we sang about it earlier, but when, uh, uh, who was it, Jairus that besought Jesus to come and, and heal his daughter, and before they could get to the house, the people came and told him, she's dead, she's gone. What do you think hit him? His little girl. He knew they wouldn't stand there and lie to him like that. They wouldn't have told him that unless they were sure that she was gone. What hit him? Oh, fear and, and discouragement, right? Grief. And see, friend, if you yield to this stuff, it'll take you out. It will defeat you. It will take you out. Jesus looked at him. Come on, tell me what he said. What did he say? Don't be afraid. Only believe. Now, it, why did he tell him that? Could this man have ruined everything if he'd have yielded to the fear? Have to be that way or Jesus wouldn't have said that. He would have just went on and done it. It had to be hanging on this. And the man must have done the right thing. How many know he had to get a hold of himself, didn't he? Because, I mean, everything in him is screaming to break and just cry and just fall in a pile on the floor and go, my baby, my baby, my little girl. But if he'd have done that, she'd have never been raised. I said, she'd have never been raised. And the people say, well, I couldn't help it. 
It's not true. I said, it's not true. If you yield to it a lot year after year, well, then it's, it's harder. You, you get used to yielding to it, but it's not true. How many know he must have done the right thing? If he wanted to say a bunch of unbelief, he must have bit his lip. <laughs> yes, sir. Don't be afraid. Can you see Jesus looking at you? Jesus, the head of the church, looking at you. Saying, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Don't be afraid. Come on, tell me, what do you say? What do you say? What do you say? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So can you fall apart now? No. You can't. What can you say? <laughs> Nothing but faith. Right? What can you do? Trust God. Paul was facing some things. Everywhere he went, people picked it up in the spirit that bonds and afflictions were waiting on him in Jerusalem. And they kept telling him, don't go, don't go. Paul, don't go. Acts 20 and 22. Acts 20 and 22, he said, now behold, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, except that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying, bonds and afflictions abide me. Now, it's one thing when people tell you trouble's waiting on you. <laughs> when the Holy Ghost tells you big trouble is waiting on you, and he confirms it in every city that you go to. <laughs> Somebody say, trouble coming. <laughs> For sure. Big trouble. I want you to tell me what he said. Next verse. Next verse. He knows trouble is coming. Big trouble. And it was. Oh, man. It was the end of his free life. And yet... He had miracle after miracle. Wrote the epistles in jail. <laughs> How many of you cannot keep a faith man down? The devils thought they had really done it when they killed Jesus. Oh, man. They thought they had done it. Now they know it's the worst thing they ever did. <laughs> you can make them that way with you, too. Faith people won't quit. They won't lay down and quit. What did he say? Read it out loud with me. None of these things move me. Well, what if you die there, Brother Paul? He talked about it in Philippians. He said, hey, for me to depart and be with Christ is far better than being here. Great. Fine with me? Is he afraid? Oh, there's no fear in him. His heart is fixed. He said, if I stay, I get more work. Helps you, I get more reward. So I like that too. <laughs> Can't be defeated. Either way I go, I'm a winner. I'm a victor. Never a victim. Always an overcomer. No matter what's going on. None of these things move me. Get that in your heart. Get that in your mind. Get that in your mouth. And when bad reports come and slap you upside the face, and I mean fear and thoughts just grab you almost before you think about it, before you grab the tissue box and pull the blinds. Come on, help me out. Tell me, what do you do? What do you do? You stand up and you say. Stand up on your feet. You stand up on your feet. And you look that thing in the eye. And tell me, what do you say? What do you say? None of these things. Yeah, yeah, but they said that you're laid off. Yeah, but they said your investments are worth nothing now. They said you lost it all. <laughs> Looks like I lost some people. Hmm? They said your, your house burnt down and your friends don't like you anymore, and your dog even left and went to somebody else's house. 
<laughs> Come on, help me out, help me out. Come on, that's, that's not quite strong enough. You... None of these things, they don't move me. I didn't say I liked them, but they don't move me because the God I trust has not changed at all. He's still sitting on the throne. His word is still true, and He still loves me. He still loves me, and He's still faithful to me. And I don't know how, and I don't see the way, but I know He'll bring me out. I will come out of this, and when the dust clears, I'll be standing here with my miracle. God will do it some way. Somehow, He will do it. I trust Him. I trust God. I trust, tell Him, say, Lord, I trust You. Say it again, Lord, I trust You. Say it again, Lord, I trust You. I trust you. Oh, just lift your hands and praise him. So. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead. Shall not be. I shall not be moved. Oh, hallelujah. I shall not be. I shall not be moved. I will be like a tree. Like a tree. First, anchored in Jehovah. Anchored in Jehovah, I shall not be moved. I'm anchored in Jehovah. Anchored in Jehovah. I say I, I shall not be moved. I will be like a tree that's planted by the water. shall not be everybody I, I shall not be I, I shall not be moved I shall not be moved I shall not be oh, I, I shall not be moved I will be, be like a tree that's planted Just praise Him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. I trust you. I do trust you. Therefore, I won't be moved. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, that same Paul that we ended up with, he said, none of these things move me. He's the one that started out this whole message saying, I know in whom I have believed. I know in whom I have believed. When you trust somebody, you have believed. You're not waiting to believe. You're not believing. You're not on your way. You're already there. Paul was already there. He had believed. Glory to God. When you had believed something, you're in full faith. You ain't moving. You ain't being moved. You can't be pushed away. Glory to God. 
We, we going to get pushed away? Anybody in here going to quit tonight? You going to walk out the door and say, you know, I don't know about all that. No, not one person is, are you? We, we trust in the Lord because we know in whom we have believed. Glory to God. And we're going to stand. We're going to stand firm because he loves us. He loves us. And we can trust him. Right? You might not trust somebody that don't love you. Somebody gives their son for you. Huh? Sends their only begotten son because he so loved you. You can trust him. Glory to God. Glory to God. Let's reaffirm our faith tonight. Even if you're saved, if you've been saved for years, this prayer will confirm in your heart God's goodness, God's love for you, and your ability to trust him with your life. So let's reaffirm and affirm our faith. If you've never prayed this prayer before, you've never made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, pray it with all your heart. And if you have, pray it with all your heart. But if you have never, you'll know there's a change. You'll know there's a change. That God's become real to you and He's your Father and Jesus is your Lord. And He loves you. So let's pray. Let's close our eyes and let's pray this all together. Say, Father God, I believe in you. I trust you. I believe that you sent your Son because you love me. I believe in Jesus. Jesus, you are my Lord. Thank you for saving me, for being my salvation, for healing my body, for protecting me, for prospering me, for giving me peace, for giving me joy, for loving me, and as you help me, I will serve you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord. Just thank him. Praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Glory to God. You feel strong? Oh, getting stronger. Getting stronger. Not being moved. Amen. Amen. Well, they're going to sing. We're going to be dismissed as we do. But if you just prayed that prayer for the first time or you knew, know something happened when you prayed that prayer tonight and you, you want to talk to somebody, there's going to be people standing along the front. If you gave your life to God tonight, come down here and let us rejoice with you. If you recommitted your life to God, let us rejoice with you. If you got questions about your salvation, you got anything you want to talk to somebody, you need a hug. There are going to be people standing down here. Glory to God. Glory to God. So as the music plays and we're singing, people are going out. You come down here. Let us love on you. Let us rejoice with you. Okay? All right. Sunday morning, 9 and 11 is going to be good then too. Amen? Amen. They're going to sing. We'll be dismissed as they do. Don't be moved.